concentration is um, a really interesting area in some ways because it's not that well um, understood. There are at least three ways of approaching it. You can look at the kind of the interaction between person and environment and look at it as, a, as an experience. You can look at it as a, in a very cognitive sense of just um, like drawing a metaphor to a machine almost and trying to look at it that way. Or you can try and attach electrodes and take measurements and see what's going on physiologically that we can detect and see if that correlates with concentration and focus and types of concentration. So what I've got here is interspersed some sciencey stuff and the stuff that I say to athletes when I'm giving the talk to them because um, I think sometimes in those sessions I've probably described it better than you can pick up in the books. So I thought I'd just use those same those same slides in places. An example being this one. Way back at the start of my career I just did a you know one slide what is concentration. And this was it, you know, the ability to maintain focus on the right cues. Um, sustaining appropriate attention for the required period of time. I always think it comes back to pointing your brain at the right stuff that you need to think about, that you need to point your attention at for that task. And it's almost, again, a circular definition because it's, it, it depends on the outcome. If you invariably get, will say a mistake in sport has been caused by a lack of concentration, quite often that's um, the case. And we find ourselves starting with that and going, well, what went wrong with it? And um, a good concentration means you're thinking about the right things, and we can tell that because you didn't mess up. So it's kind of a circular definition, which is not good. We can probably do better than that. And there are attempts in here to, to achieve that, but generally speaking, thinking about the right thing at the right time is adequate, at least to get us moving. The other way of looking at it is not drifting off not being distracted. And in fact, when I'm talking with athletes, I just go through three, three things. Getting focused in the first place, which might be part of your routine or your warm-up. Staying focused and not being distracted. And then something quite important, recovering your focus when you've been distracted, which kind of must happen at some point. You know, If we're human beings, we're going to get distracted and being able to recover would define somebody as being a good mental athlete. We can, the main distinctions we see, and you'll see it when we come to this theory in a few minutes, are the distinction between a broad and narrow focus. Am I scanning a large area looking for gaps in the defence, or am I focusing on something very, very small, for example, the gold bit in the middle of an archery target? Or am I looking for a very small stimulus amongst many things, and that's, that has to be what I watch. So the broad and narrow distinction is key. And the internal external distinction is very much key, where you're either looking outside yourself for in a physical world, or perhaps, and I'll try and give examples, looking inside, trying to broadly get psyched up, or trying to remember some important small detail, like um, a call in, a, in a, a game, or a tactic, or an opponent's weakness, something like that. Towards the end, you'll see there's a number of strategies we can try and use. And um, it reminds me quite a lot of a session I was at a little while ago with someone who was delivering uh, a different topic, emotional intelligence, at a high level with elite athletes. And she went through all the theories. And then when it came to actually working with the athletes, she kind of ignored all the theories and was just trying to do some good work. Uh, and what it meant was saying, well, what does this mean to you? And how does it affect your game in your tactics and your personality? And all the theories had almost rendered themselves useless by being um, heavily questionnaire-based, um, you know, not applied to real life, but too theoretical. So she found that she had to just sit with them and talk to them. And as we get to the end, you'll find that seems to be the case here, because people are different, sports are different, tasks within each sport are different. So you often have to say exactly what's going to work for that person. Going way back to the beginning, 1890. I think I mention William James quite often because he's seen as one of the kind of fathers of psychology in general. Um, but I, you know, we should be aware that he just sat with a blank page 
and wrote. He didn't do any research. He just said, what do I think concentration is? What do I think you know, confidence is? Whatever it might be. He just wrote. And that introspection was, in the beginning, all we had to even call science. And it was a reaction against that that gave us behaviorism subsequently. The idea of stimulus response and treat it like science. But this is, and you know, sometimes he, he wrote reams and reams, you know, a big pile of like, three or four volumes. And in that much, you're going to get the odd gem, the odd good bit. And so, sure enough, the little thing like this come out. Everyone knows what attention is. It's taking possession by the mind in a clear and vivid form of one out of what seems of several possible um, stimuli or objects or trains of thought. Focalizing and concentrating consciousness are its essence. And it implies withdrawal from some stimuli or thoughts to focus on other ones. That's not a bad definition for a very long time ago. When it goes right, as I said, we often say, well, that person was concentrating well. And some people could sum it up quite nicely. So uh, they're more focused for a race, looking um, tunnel vision all the way, concentration so intense, I almost forgot to look up and see my time afterwards. That sounds like a wonderful description of just perfect concentration in the moment. Nothing else matters, not even the time, just the performance. And, you know, cricket's a good example where guys are asked to stay at the crease for long periods of time. Uh, a quote from Atherton saying, I just focus on each ball, one at a time, giving it 100% concentration. And their success stories, and they would say, well, good, that worked. The question would be, well, what if someone appeared to be having that experience or applying that technique and somehow still made a mistake? Would we say that they are concentrating or because the outcome was wrong that they weren't? And, you know, we can, can play with these ideas. Sticking with cricket for a second, you know, um, you see people develop little routines and little um, processes to try and maintain their concentration. So I'm always, when, I, when they actually show it on TV, I'm always captivated by uh, Jonathan Trotz sort of going for a walk, doing some gardening, and he's very deliberate, and it's always almost identical. And the idea might be that having the same routine before each shot should lead to a very similar mental state. And as long as that state's suitable, then it's good for performing, or at least performing at the same level. So there we go. My loose translation, thinking about the right stuff at the right time. And stealing from William James, it might mean focusing on one thing, uh, looking at multiple things and making a, a broad judgment. And this is key, very often we talk about being able to switch between things. So you can disengage from that and re-engage somewhere else. So things that we can think about here, but certainly you would ask with an athlete, might be what happens when your concentration breaks? What things break your concentration? And the interesting thing is it doesn't have to be a sight or a sound. It can be a thought. It can be just remembering that, oh, my girlfriend's here today, which I've heard distract guys quite often. I was remembering the importance of the situation, which is enough to shake you out of your concentration and your focus and start thinking about other stuff, the wrong stuff. And then you can say, okay, well, to solve that, what things help me concentrate? Is it going through a routine? Is it um, trying to deliberately and effortfully focus on something even though other things are distracting me? Is that possible? Can I just force myself to think about it? And how do I deal with distractions? And, you know, in a very brutal way sometimes, people just um, have to train for distractions and have to just... I've been in a situation with archery once where I just brought along a sound effect tape from a TV station and just played the sound of a train going past and the sound of planes taking off just to try and get these kids able to focus with loud, distracting noises going on. And, believe it or not, that's uh, supposed to work. So sticking with the kind of classic one bird and gold approach for now, we can say focusing on the right cues, selecting the, the ones that matter, staying focused in the face of distractions, and then within that there's the idea of this situational awareness. Um, and being... This, this comes with uh, knowledge of the game, shall we say, whatever your game might be. Knowing 
what's going on, what the next logical step would be. And one of the great things we see about elite athletes is that they're very able to identify what the next correct action to take is, and they, have, they aren't distracted by all the less good options. So in any situation, especially in open, flexible team sports where lots of things are going on at once, there's lots of wrong options and there's lots of possible quite good options. But one of the things that experience gives the elite athlete is just knowing what the right option is. I've seen this a hundred times, I know that if I make that pass, he's in on goal, for example. And that awareness is another key attribute of concentration. And that one is very hard to train. So I went and dug up this video, no, this video, this picture a long time ago because everyone I was with at the time said that is a lapse in concentration. And um, I forgot his name. World Cup final. Pommies are about to beat the Australian in 2003. All he's got to do is catch the ball and put it down. And he's inches away from the try line. Shouldn't be an issue. But if you look at the number on his back, in number five, like I used to be. We don't score tries very often, that's not our job. World Cup final. You can imagine the situation where he's thinking, I'm going to score! I'm going to score a try right there! He fails to catch the ball. Just somehow his attention drifted off the ball onto something else, and everyone I was with said, that's a lapse in concentration. And it could have been very costly, it led to extra time, and luckily still went to the guys in white. But Lapses in concentration are frequently attributed, well, the, as the cause of performance failures. You could say, well, lack of motivation is a cause sometimes as well, but it would look different. You'd see someone not trying and their body language would be different. So if someone is trying their heart out and somehow still fails. I wanted to just focus on that last point for a second as well, because I think it's really interesting, the idea of trying to block out distractions. And you'll hear it said really frequently, especially by coaches or um, parents, don't think about that, just block it out. So I want to do an example with you. So if you want to play along, you haven't even got to flinch. Not that many of you are flinching or looking that in interested, but if I say to you, whatever you do, for goodness sake, don't think of a big white bear. You do. Whatever you do, for goodness sake, don't think of a shiny red car. A Ferrari comes into mind straight away. And you can't help that. And that's because the way the human brain works is to process information, not to block and suppress information. So it's really hard, and it takes a lot of training, to even attempt that. Instead, a more productive solution seems to be to be uh, relaxed and able to overcome those thoughts when they, when they creep into your head. So, um, we often talk about thought parking or thought stoppage when, when thoughts go around your mind and become distracting. Uh, examples I've had in the past would be, I think I might have said this recently, I got a team of players to write down the, the things that were distracting them on a piece of paper. And it was you know, all sorts of things from semi-final, really big match, girlfriends here, parents are here, um, I've given too much time to this and my university work's suffering, a whole list of stuff. And each person put it into an envelope, sealed the envelope, and locked it in a safe that I'd taken along to the game. It was just bought from your equivalent of Bunnings, and it was locked away. So that's parked. It's not squashed out of your brain, but it's, there's no good thinking about that for the next 48 hours, just prepare for the game. Me being young at the time, I thought it was silly, but I'd give it a try. And it worked an absolute treat. Players, you know, A, we won, of course, that's helpful, but, you know, players who I'd never have thought would come and talk to me have said, that was, that was great, how did you do that, how did you know that was going to work? And players who I might never have been exposed to in that team wanted to talk psychology all, all of a sudden. The guys who were too cool for it, or too macho, suddenly wanted to talk to me. And that's an example of thought parking. And equally, having an answer to all the distracting thoughts, knowing that they're irrational and unhelpful and um, you might actually be able to test them in the next uh, few seconds rather than worrying about them, that's also a good way of just ending the cycle of negative thought that distracts people. But certainly blocking stuff out doesn't seem to work.
So to summarise the beginning, we believe that athletes tend to be able to develop the right type of concentration to their sport, which is kind of defined by succeeding in the sport. If you're succeeding, you're concentrating appropriately for that sport, a circular definition. But the descriptions that we get from people seem to be more than just circular, you know, talk about being absorbed and having no distracting thoughts about the future, the past, or the present, nothing distracts them. Um, mentally relaxed and loose and able to respond to whatever situation puts in front of them. And extremely aware. You get stories of people saying, uh, you know, I, I always knew what the opponent was going to do before they did it. And I could see that punch coming before it was even started, or I could see that pass coming before it was even initiated. And it's just this level of extreme awareness people get when they're perfectly focused. And I mean, again, it, that must come from experience. It absolutely must. So I want to unpack how different people have approached that. At least three approaches. A humanistic approach, generally summarised as, as flow states, which is the next lecture. So I'm going to give a brief summary and move on. The cognitive approach is going to get an awful lot of attention, because it's got several slides, attention, haha. But, you know, it might not be right, it's just an approach. And then the biological approach of seeing what we can measure and seeing if that relates to types of concentration. So very briefly, the, f the idea of flow came from studying people who achieved something wonderful um, so Chikzen Mihaly, I believe I pronounced it right, uh, studied brain surgeons, concert pianists and musicians, um, fighter pilots, and some wonderful sports performers, and some fantastic artists, and just said, what's it like when you perform your absolute best? Now, again, I work as a psychologist in sports, so the response isn't surprising to me, but when he was doing this, it was because they all told the same story. The idea of the rest of life just fades into the background and I cease to become aware of it and I don't get distracted by things happening around me. Um, and if anything, the action that I'm performing and my consciousness just kind of merge into one. And I cease to be thinking about what I'm doing and evaluating it. It's just happening effortlessly. I know exactly what I'm doing in terms of clear goals. Um, anything that I'm looking for in terms of how well I'm doing is just perfect and I can see it and I'm in control. So no distraction, no sort of looking at anything else, just complete involvement in the moment. Very frequently people say they, they've lost track of time. And we've all had that, at least we've all had that in terms of just driving a car for a long distance and going, how far have I travelled? Most of us would have been through that moment where we've just lost track of time. But it can also happen when you're writing, when you're playing your sport, very easily. People cease to be self-conscious because, again, they're not evaluating, so they start, stop worrying about what everyone else is going to think, and they're just completely engrossed in what they're doing. And they feel totally in control. And one of the key attributes of this process is that this is probably more a determining factor than a part of the experience, but people judge that whatever they're being asked to do is exactly what they're capable of doing. It's not too hard to be anxiety-inducing, it's not so easy as to be boring, it's just perfect. In the Goldilocks situation again. Now, the autotelic part of it just, I think, refers to the idea that it's also a very pleasant, rewarding experience. And when, so next week, I'll, I'll mention it, but um, I've supervised one PhD to completion. It was by a guy called Christian Swan. And he, uh, he did a very good job, I think, of unpacking what flow really is and how it applies in elite sport. But we spent probably a couple of weeks just, just trying to work out if the experience of flow, maybe it isn't the cause of peak performance. Maybe it's a built-in reward mechanism for doing something really well at the best of your ability. It's just a pleasant feeling that you get when you're absolutely buzzing and doing something fantastically well. 
And it is meant to be a very motivating experience that you want to get and have again and again. So that's so in a nutshell, and next week I want to go through where it came from, the factors that produce it or undermine it, and how we, how we study it. But the idea is it's this, as I said, challenge skills balance, the interaction between the environment and the person's capability. And that's the humanist interactionist perspective. You could also, you know, much as that's what we've put up here as our slide, you could also say that that interactionist approach could be applied to concentration without having to refer to flow. We could just apply that approach anyway and just compare the task to the person's capability and their preferences and see if that fits. But the textbook says humanism is flow. Second approach, the cognitive approach, treating the brain as a computer or a machine. And again, this is a very dominant approach because it's got a wonderful matching questionnaire to go with it. And we love questionnaires, psychologists, right? So we conceptualise people as having attentional styles, as preferences as to how they pay attention. And I'll show you those in a second. And again, conceptualising it as something stable and therefore consistent over time so we can make predictions from it, I mean that we can do questionnaires, and, and correlate them to stuff, which is our favourite way of doing science and psychology. But it, it doesn't have to be the case. It could be that really easily um, your ability to pay, pay attention and the way you pay attention may depend on time of day, your food and drink intake, how much caffeine you've had, all of these things. Whether you've been active recently is a huge predictor of your ability to concentrate afterwards. We know that. So it's not necessarily good to conceptualise it as a trait, but that's what we've been doing for a long time. So the basic theory is if you can match the person's disposition for paying attention to the task, then that's perfect. If someone's normal personality preference is not actually what the task requires, we're going to either have to retrain them or pick a new task. So, really simplistically, I, I took the ages to draw these diagrams, by the way, so I hope you appreciate them. We treat attention as a spotlight, pointing either outwards and nice and focused, or more like a kind of broad search at multiple things, again pointing outwards. So you can go unfocused outwards or tight focused outwards, but it's external focus. So, in archery, it might be focusing in gradually on the gold spot in the middle. Whereas, again this is an archery example, um, when they're stood there trying to work out, because they have to not only be a good archer but a good engineer to work out how, how their bow is working and how successful it is, maybe they need to be aware of which, which bit need adjustment. And they have to learn that skill. But of course a much more obvious example is a uh, fly half scanning a defence for gaps or yeah, a soccer player scanning, looking for the right path, that kind of thing. Yeah. Broad focus, out there, looking at multiple stimuli. But you can also point inwards, so you could focus on one particular aspect you're trying to drag up from memory, a tactic, or a buzzword, or whatever it might be. And people do have, you know, their favourite words or favourite moments, or uh, strategy in terms of how did I solve this problem last time I had it. And it can be something which comes naturally, or it can be something you have to effortfully drag up from memory. And potentially we could have to scan broadly in, inside ourselves in terms of looking for uh, an attempt to psych up or psych down, I said already. Um, scanning for fatigue is something people are sometimes asked to do. And that's something in archery especially you're asked to try and relax all the appropriate muscles so that there's no tension because if you have to have a very precise stance, if you're unaware of some fatigue in a particular back muscle or calf muscle and it's just tweaking you slightly out, that can lead to you having very accurate but off-target clusters. So you can divide that up quite nicely, broad versus narrow, external versus internal. And again, that's a memorable model, which is probably why it's stuck so well. 
memorable and a questionnaire, right, that's it. Success. So you can ask people for their sport, you know, sticking with archery is where I started on this from, but I used to work in archery, so sorry. So where's your focus just before you release the arrow? Well, of course, it's on the centre of the gold, hopefully. I've never spoken to anybody who didn't say that. Maybe that was just the club that I was working for, though. What about um, what happens when you get distracted? Well, most of the time, it's either internal or external. Rather than thinking about the right thing, you get taken somewhere else. Other thoughts get into your head, inappropriate thoughts that aren't helping you hit that goal, and that's a lapse in concentration. And you can, you know, you can put that to many sports. So you can say, okay, uh, I said rugby team once. I said, what's your typical zone when you're playing? I said, well, most of the time my attention is just kind of out there scanning, especially fly half in rugby. They're always just taking in the big picture, trying to see where everybody is, where their players are, what's going to be the next opportunity to do something impressive. So they're generally broad and external. You know, that could be what the guy said. What happens when you're under pressure? Oh, I start worrying about um, selection. I start worrying about what people are going to think of me. And suddenly the attention might go inwards or, you know, very much off into the wrong direction. What about different situations? Then the same person who's used to having to scan an entire picture of people might suddenly have to kick an all-important penalty at the end of the match and their focus might just be perhaps at an area in the middle of the post. Uh, I remember Johnny Wilkinson used to talk about and not only seeing the, the flight of the ball through a gap in the middle of the post, but right down into an imaginary bucket held by an imaginary lady called Mavis. And he used to see all of that before he even kicked the ball. Or it could be that it's uh, narrow and external on the exact spot of the ball you want to kick. But it's still the same idea. So when I was going through this once with a team, I would go through all the different situations I could think of, and we could profile more situations of where is your attention during these key moments. So recalling weaknesses of an opposition in defence, not seeing them in front of you, but it was recalling them from previous matches or from the video footage, that would be internal, but presumably a broad focus in terms of these are several things we could be looking for. Um, whereas if you say I'm looking for a gap right now in the opposition defence, that would be external and broad. Now you can give that treatment to most sports and most performance situations, so it's very applicable very, sorry, easy to apply, doesn't necessarily mean that it's right, but it ticks a lot of the boxes that we need. It has a good questionnaire, it's very memorable, it's very easy to use, just like our inverted youth theory, for example. It ticks those same boxes. So, people have a preference. Particular sports tend to make certain demands on people more, and so it might be that we need to match the person's style to the sport. And the other thing we need to do is say, well, can people switch? Presumably, if you can switch between intentional styles easily, and it isn't a big effort, then you're going to be more effective in your sport. These are the kinds of things that this theory predicts. Now, Luckily, some of those things do seem to link to elite performance. Being able to switch seems to predict. It seems to be a skill that some elite performers have. And again, you can, you can add, a, add some questions on that to the questionnaire. How easily can you switch between these things? And the guys who score highly on that seem to do well. But correlation is not causation. And then, of course, there's, you know, the guys, another key attribute that elite performers have seems to be to form narrow external focus. That is just as a trend, no matter what the sport is, that seems to be something, again, just a correlation. But there are, there's more to concentration than just this model. And it doesn't, it doesn't explain how. It doesn't explain the mechanism of what's going on in the background. It's a lovely metaphor but it doesn't give us the nuts and bolts of exactly what is happening in that brain or in that system 
to give any information. The questionnaire is called the test of attention and interpersonal styles. Um, generally, it looks at a trait. You can try and do um, state measures. And certain elite athletes seem to score better on certain subscales. Fine. As I said already, it tends to mean that you can therefore see someone's preference types of errors they might make might be that they tend to always, for example, look slip into a broad external focus when that's the wrong focus for their sport. So it allows you to at least navigate attention and it gives you a common language with the athlete, which is often very important. Moving on to the biological approach, let's see what we can measure and see if that links to attention. So you could do brain scans, EEGs, heart rate, there's loads of stuff we can measure on people. Now does that predict or associate with good concentration? You should already be a little bit suspicious because there's, we've already discussed lots of different types of concentration. So there's the flow experience which is very unique and subjective but there are common phrases and words used within it. There's the different approach which has at least four different types there's a switching between tasks, all of these things, you know. So wh wh what should we expect to see in a brain that's, that's doing any of those things? And in some ways our techniques aren't good enough yet. You know, we haven't got a mobile MRI that we can point at someone as they're moving around playing sport and detect when they've slipped into a flow state. It's just too difficult to do. But what we do have are some suggestive results. For example, um, shooters can, maybe not even knowing they're doing it, but they seem to slow their heart rate down as they approach the point where they pull the trigger. And when you're doing something with such fine margins for error, breathing and, and heart rate actually do matter because they make tiny movements in your body. And so you'll, and you can see the guys, and they'll often do, you know, tell you about how breathing, at least, they will breathe at the bottom of an outbreath. Sorry, they'll pull the trigger at the bottom of an outbreath every time, and that should correspond to a, a reduction in heart rate anyway. But they even often, without knowing it, pull the trigger at between heartbeats perfectly every time. The brainwave activity and I'll show you it, the study, the reference in a second, but the brainwave activity, people who are about to pull a trigger or release an arrow, often slip into a particular type of brainwave, brainwave activity called the alpha pattern. And there are multiple different types of brainwaves, alpha, beta, gamma, whatever, and they indicate different levels of noise in the brain, different levels of how much is going on at least. Um, a classic finding back in 87 was that the left brain slips into alpha activity, which is the meant to be, on average, in most people, the analytical side of the brain, where you do language and math. That just basically what that means is that part of the brain goes quiet. And you stop analysing and you stop thinking and reasoning. And it's just peaceful for a second. And that's when you pull the trigger. Someone in this room may have been in the tube last week where I almost slipped into this part of the lecture by accident. Um, does anybody else know what happens at the other time in your life where you slip into just alpha activity in the brain? You do it every day. Just before you go to sleep in that little few moments where you've thought about what's happened that day and what you have to do tomorrow and you're just starting to relinquish control and as thoughts pop into your head they pop out just as easily because you're no longer um, taking control and analysing them. In that moment where it's just free, free flow and usually that slips into dreams immediately afterwards, that's alpha activity. So I hope that gives you an idea of what it's like. It's not effortful, it's not conscious 
deliberate, it's very relaxed. Good shout. Heart rate we can measure. Many things affect heart rate. Um, many more influential things on heart rate. So perhaps concentration isn't going to be the best um, thing to measure using heart rate. But, you know, we get little trends. As I said, even golfers, as they are about to hit a putt, their heart rate seems to slow down. It's just difficult to know exactly how useful this is. It's interesting and it's objective for the first time. You know, it's not just a questionnaire, it's something objective. But is it measuring exactly what we need? And somewhere between humanistic, cognitive, biological measures, we have to find a way forward. We have to be able to pick something that allows us to study it and make progress. And given how tentative and often inappropriate or unhelpful our measurement techniques are, we then have to be careful about the claims that we make. So if we do find a trend using any of those measurement techniques, we should probably be very careful in, and not say we've conclusively proven something, but rather there appears to be an association between these things. And when you're doing your coursework, you'll notice that I always pick up on anything that's overclaimed. If you can only claim exactly what the evidence supports, I'm very happy indeed. So moving on now to the types of errors and what you can do about it. And you'll notice here, we can almost abandon theory and just work anyway. And it goes back to the example I was talking about earlier. Typical errors might include overload of information, can tell distractions in terms of thoughts or um, incorrect patterns of thinking. I'll explain that in a second. External distractions, and I've often heard about people just finding themselves distracted by silly things like a dog on the side of the pitch or you know, just the cars on the road going nearby. And that would obviously be um, inappropriate to think about and unhelpful to think about. But what can you do about it? Focusing on the wrong cues, and, you know, people will often report that they just um, they know they shouldn't think about something over it for their sport but they find their attention drawn to it and then the idea of de-automisation which sounds weird but I'll just hold back talking about it for a couple of seconds until I get to the slide overload is one of the, the ways I talk about it quite frequently I think it's a nice metaphor um, and it kind of fits with a lot of other theories so in terms of having some consistency, it's a nice way of thinking about it. We tend to be limited in what we can think about, especially deliberately and cognitively. We tend to have a limit of seven-ish things. Shopping list you can remember will be seven-ish things. If I give you a list of names or items in a memory game, most ordinary mortals remember about seven things. In sport, that seems to drop rapidly. It seems to become nearer three-ish things you can really maintain awareness of before stuff starts getting dropped out. And it's a bandwidth metaphor. And the idea is if there's too much going on, then there's a strong possibility of the bandwidth just being choked up. You can't think about the right things. Or at the very least, you have to be very selective in what you do think about to make sure that the right things are going through that small, uh, limited channel. That's one of the reasons that um, goal setting can often be helpful, is because you just have to say, what do you actually care about here and now? And you know, in our job in particular, there's a lot of things we're supposed to do. We're supposed to teach, research, we're supposed to build links with industry and stuff like that. And there are times where you're completely overwhelmed. So you have to say, what have I set out to do this week? I've got my teaching, I've got one thing to write. The rest of it is just going to have to be put on the back burner. So the idea is you think about goals and just the basics of what you're trying to achieve. That might help you focus and not be distracted and not choke up your cognitive capacity to think. That's one explanation. And you can also ask, well, any athlete, when does your concentration tend to break down? Is it certain moments, certain skills? And I used to work a lot in rugby, and you'd be amazed how people would suddenly make mistakes after injuries. 
or after um, the ball had gone out of play and got lost for a few seconds. So they're perfectly fine, they're in the moment, and then there's an injury, everyone has to stop for a few seconds, and everything goes to pot for a few seconds. It's really, you know, minutes after that, after half time, there's loads of mistakes. And if you can work out what it is about that moment, then you can usually come up with some sort of solution. So if it's always just after half time, perhaps you have to have a routine. If it's always just before half time, or what is it that you're being distracted by? Is it fatigue, or is it um, you're starting to become conscious of what the coach will say and starting to second guess what the coach might feed back to you? Forget that. That's not important. <laughs> Forget it. As if I just, I just said earlier, don't don't block thoughts out. But it allows you to say that is an unhelpful thought. Let's just park it for a second and focus on the next few moves. So uh, again, without needing to refer to a theory, you can look at the problem, when it occurs, the situation it occurs in, and that can be enough. And that's difficult because a lot of science feels like you need to have a theory to, to do anything. But because of the nature of people's concentration and the nature of multiple, multiple sports with different tasks within them, maybe we just need to be very individualised and very tailor-made each time. A different types of distractions would be internal distractions, things that have happened in the past, things that might happen in the future. It's thoroughly unhelpful to you in the here and now, most of the time. Especially if it's... Um, um, the last time I played this team I made a bad mistake and I uh, really worried about doing it again. That's not helpful. If it's, I'm aware of how these guys play and their preferences and their tactics, that's useful. And likewise, you hear about people thinking about the future in terms of, uh, I was watching the, the cricket analysis when it was rained off and they were talking about bowling sets of deliveries. So bowling three in the build up to the fourth and the three first ones set you up for the fourth. And that's fine, that's planning, that's Good, but thinking about whether I'm going to get selected or you know what someone's going to think of me, I've said already, they're not helpful. Generally speaking, that evaluative, worrisome capacity we have is not what you see in elite sport. And I'll just pause for a second and, and just refine that point. Most elite sport, that focus, that um, experience of flow I talked about the experience of alpha brain waves where you just relinquish control of your brain and let it do what it's good at. None of that is effortful, deliberate, mechanical thinking. And I've said before though, the reason we have this massive brain that's very good at analysing is because it solves problems. And one way you can guarantee putting someone off or psyching them out when they're playing really, really well is just to sow some seed that gets them thinking. Because the thinking part of the brain is very rarely the same part of the brain that controls elegant, refined movements. I first read that in Timothy Galway's books about self one and self two, even though there's barely any science in them at times. It was a neat metaphor to say one bit's for thinking, one bit's for doing. But if you can just, and many, many things that we do are a response to a problem get you thinking. Now, thinking part of the brain is not able to deal with multiple moving body parts at once. Too much. So if any self-doubt, any self-consciousness, any worries or fears can turn on that part of the brain and that can normally undermine sporting performance very, very easily. And you can get mistakes that wonderful players suddenly look like amateurs because they're playing like when they were an amateur. In fact, if you were here for the motor control course that I taught, we progressed through stages. The first stage is thinking about it a lot and moving in a really wooden sense. And the final stage is being all fluid and elegant and not thinking about it. And yet just there's a deep irony when we're struggling in the most important moments, we often turn our brain on and go back to thinking about it and being all wooden. So that would be a good example of how to distract someone. Another example would be fatigue. And that's really hard to deal with, by the way. Um, genuine mental fatigue. Um, so we've got some research happening here at the moment where we just get someone to do 
a fairly boring task just um, with a string of letters and you've got to work out if the A and the X appear in the right order. You do that for like an hour and a half and it's, it seems easy, but it's just working on one little tiny part of the brain. And then you ask someone to do something which seems completely unrelated, like cycling or some physical task, and without any awareness of why, they're suddenly not as good and they find it incredibly hard just because they've been thinking hard for a while. And you can reference that Markora 2010, they found it first and we're extending it. But it's a huge problem, you know, if someone's just tired from the stress of the media coverage or, you know, some last minute problems they've had with travel or whatever it might be, there's a really strong link to how they can then perform. And the same, even spanning from a thinking task to a strength task or a cardiovascular task, people still seem to struggle. And we haven't yet got as far as how on earth you would try and address that. You know, the classic techniques in terms of self-talk and imagery or goal setting, how, how would that help? I'm not sure it would. Uh, there are other tricks in the in the book, but um, it might be that you have to... There's one example I heard of recently, people just would uh, con their body by having a, a mouth rinse, and the flavour of sugar and carbohydrate would con their brain to thinking that it would it had, had more energy. And within the brain, it, between the blood-brain barrier, there'd be a release of glucose, and the brain would have a bit more oomph, should we say, for a few seconds. And it was literally a con, you'd spat the, the drink back out, but it still worked. So there are tricks you can do to try to overcome fatigue, but we're, we're really a long way behind on addressing that one. For now, the trick would be pacing. It would be trying to prevent yourself getting fatigued in the first place. I've mentioned already, there are visual distractions, auditory distractions, and gamesmanship, and sledging, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. My dad is still family champion at most sports um, because he can say to you when you're playing really well, well that was good, how did you do that? And it seems like a wonderful thing to say, thank you very much. But then you go, how did I do that? And you start thinking about it and you mess it up. So finally the optimization. I said I was going to talk about it. This is the exact process I was just talking about whereby something which is automated that you can do unconsciously without any effort you then start thinking about it. And you, so it's been automized and you drag it back into conscious control. It's a very popular theory. And as I say, in evolutionary terms, the reason we're such a great species is because we can stop what we're doing and think about it and problem solve. And that's a great skill to have and it's worth building this massive brain to do. But in sport, it's frequently very unhelpful indeed. So, Baumeister's choking theory, um, Hardy and all these guys, studies of anxiety, often have the same under underlying idea that you've got something you're very, very good at, it's all automated, but you wrestle control back and your conscious brain is not designed to regulate that process. In a way, I've already explained it, so I don't need to go over it anymore. <laughs> Things you can do about it. Practice. Again, I, I felt it was quite stupid at the time, but I once gave some guys a numbers grid, and you have to just scan, and the numbers are all jumbled up, and you have to scan for one, and then two, and then three. I thought it was just silly, but they swore it helped them to control their focus by actually focusing outside and taking over their visual search process, and they said, yeah, we think that's a good training technique. You can do things like simulating the environment where it's going to happen. So if you don't normally train with a crowd, well, get used to having a crowd around. Many people's explanations of goal setting are that it focuses your mind on exactly what you need to do and not what all the distractions are. I mentioned before, routines by their nature are meant to A, contain things in them that help you focus and are helpful to your task, but B, if it's a routine that you do all the time, it should create the same mental state, the same brain waves, the same everything, if it's a good routine that you're consistent with. Imagery 
imagining situations that might be happening and what to do in them. Self-talk not only can be motivating or confidence building, but it can focus you on what you need to be doing. You can just memorize lists of instructions or um, processes. If we're using physiological measures, biological measures, heart rate, EEG, whatever, then biofeedback becomes useful. And there's, this, um, there's that game you can play right now where you control a ball or a mouse just by wearing a, a hat with sensors in it. And you can use that to train someone to develop a certain type of brainwave pattern. Mixed results, of course, it's still early days, but it's possible. You can train people to use certain triggers um, to identify key moments where they know their attention normally goes and to use that instead as a trigger to go through a particular routine. So when the injury happens, it is obviously, in rugby, it is obviously distracting and you could think about how that going to affect our chances, who's going to fill that spot, or you could just focus on, right, what do I need to think about for the next few seconds to get back into this game? Centering is an awkward one, but it's just the idea of trying to breathe and relax, and, and that, for some people, is useful if you've been dragged into a state of being over-aroused or anxious, trying to some, somehow deliberately focus and control your breathing again is useful. And I've mentioned thought parking, the idea of sometimes you have to just write it down or, or take the thought out of your head. And I once heard the example, and it was a weird example, called black boxing, where people would... Uh, they couldn't write it down because they were in the middle of a game, but they had an imaginary box in their head where they would put the thought and keep it there. Which, if we know about, go back to that slide a few minutes ago about seven things you can think of, I guess you can only keep seven things in that box, but they would say, listen, it's not helping me play. Let's put it in the black box and deal with it at half time or at the end. Any of those are good examples, potentially useful examples, depending on the person, the situation, etc. You can train people to deal with external distractions by going through exact replications as much as possible or by, like I said, you know, playing in distracting noises or flashing lights, whatever it might be. Uh, that's you know, why people rehearse for big events. That's the whole point. If you don't want to be as expensive or as tiring, you can also rehearse mentally. I know many people who have become very good at mental rehearsal. Internally, I've said, you know, you can divide up this list into internal and external tactics, and it looks a bit like these two slides here. Maybe more of them are, are internal because, well, if it's psychology anyway, most of the problems you might be facing tend to be psychological and internal distractions. But there's no, there's no rocket science. In a way, it's what we're currently having to do very often as an applied psychologist is just a kind of very pragmatic problem-solving approach. What's going on? When does it happen? How bad is it when it happens? Okay, try, try this. That seems like it might work. That's not work. Let's try this. It's fairly pragmatic and just trial and error. And this is a list of things you could try. No guarantee any of them are going to work first up for anybody. But overall, the argument goes, people who are focusing well tend to perform well. So peak performance is this idea about being focused in the moment. And Bob Rotella is a big golf uh, writer. And he, you know, this is a guy who's even gone as far as trying to tell people not to look at the scoreboard. That's a distraction. Just hit your next shot. Yeah, so that's fairly extreme example of trying to get someone just to think about what they have to think about in that moment. Like everything else I'm talking about, really, it would be a, something we view as a skill that you can train. If you can't train it, it's very difficult to do psychology. You can diagnose and say, tough, you're in the wrong job, but the, the idea is it is a skill. Now, we frequently see that aspects of concentration, when we can measure them, as I've shown you in this lecture, appear to be common to elite athletes. And the non-elite athletes don't appear to be as good. 
isn't quite to say that that's what maybe elite athletes good. That would be a different type of test to discover that. But the trend seems to go in that direction. So for now, we assume concentration is good, and we assume we can try and improve it. But as I said at the beginning, and in a way to illustrate the point very nicely, there is this circularity. Going back to the beginning, we have circularity whereby we define good concentration as succeeding and bad concentration as often what led to a failure. We have to get around that if we're going to do good science. So if you're content with that, that's it from me.